Mark Bittman is the author of more than, or about 30 books uh, who are, that are acclaimed, including the How to Cook Everything series, and currently teaches at Columbia University. His most recent cookbook, published just last month, is called Dinner for Everyone. Dominique Crenn is an award-winning chef who recently became the first woman in the United States to receive three Michelin stars for her San Francisco restaurant, Atelier Crenn. It's the equivalent of winning an Oscar uh, in the culinary world. You guys are both a couple of overachieving people in the culinary space. Well, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Well, thank you for having us. Absolutely. Um, I think we should start with the fact that it's very interesting that neither of you are classically trained in any culinary educational system. You both came to it in your, uh, in your own way. I'd uh, love to hear about how you, how you became you know, a chef. Just to start, we'll start with you. So, <clears throat> I don't know if I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> four, was it four restaurants later? <laughs> um, I mean, the word chef is, is, is so tricky, I think. Okay. Um, well, um, I s have studied uh, economy and international business, and uh, obviously I grew up in an amazing culture in France of food and sharing and the farm of from some of the part of my family. And, and I think, you know, I, did, I, did, I was not, you know, like younger. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be, you know, a cook. And I think it's... Uh, I just get into it because I I thought that that was uh, uh, first of all I always thought that food food is a language and for me I wanted to bring my voice to the forefront and to do that I understood uh, a very at a very young age the importance also of food and it's not just about serving people and it's about uh, understanding. Uh, uh, that food matters in a lot of ways, you know, going, when I was very young, going on the farm, you know, picking up potato at my uncle's farm and understanding, you know, the work through it, but, but the, the, the purpose of, you know, growing things and where they come from. And, and so I came to San Francisco and obviously I fell in love with San Francisco and I'm like, well, I need to do something. So maybe I should get into the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I... I started, but uh, not just to have a job, but I knew very young, in a very young age, that when I was in San Francisco, that is something that will evolve to something a little bit more serious and deeper. And and now it's, I think it's a platform and it's uh, I want to be a part of it. And I feel very uh, fortunate and grateful that um, those awards uh, have been given to us, but for us, you know, it's not about the awards, it's about really what you do with it and, and how you can uh, idealize, you know, this platform and, and to do better things out there, so. In San Francisco, you, I, I believe you have four restaurants, yes? Four restaurants, yes. yes. We're working on the fourth one. It mm. uh, will be um, a very interesting concept and um, uh, we partner with uh, Mark Benioff, which is at Salesforce, and it would be a place of uh, to have fun, to have good food, but also to perhaps help to change consumer behavior. Cool. Through waste and through non-plastic, and to try to uh, to engage, to re-engage, and uh, not just about obviously the food will be also uh, there is it will be a purpose with the food, but I think it's also we want to start a conversation also with the consumer. It's really exciting. I can't wait to, to see that. Uh, Mark, you and your origin story. I mean, I just want to say, look, this is a three-star chef, which is a big deal, right? And, um, and she is a great chef. But you asked her that question, and she, she talked about a platform. She talked about making things better. She talked about bringing better food to people. She didn't talk about garnishing. She didn't talk about technique. She didn't really talk about ingredients. She talked about the stuff that really, really matters. And maybe that's precisely because she wasn't classically trained, mm. because she came to this from a place of wanting to do things better. Um, and I don't even know if I can claim the same for me, but you know, I'm not, I'm not a chef. I'm a home cook. I always have been a home cook. And I think, you know, if we're going to say, if I'm going to point to the things that are my achievements, 
it's not really cooking. It's communicating. It's it's using food as a platform to say, here's how we're going to make things better. And 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 it's not you know it's not a coincidence that we're sitting here together because um, we both approach things that way. Mm -hmm. So. I was going to say that's actually one of the things uh, that uh, is interesting about you is that you do you spend a lot of time communicating about food and lifestyle and culture around it. So uh, that that struck me as really different about you. Um, both of you are here at South by Southwest for a panel session talking about lo the localization of food to restore human health. Um, can you give us a preview about this session? That's this afternoon, in fact. Who? Oh. Well, well, we'll start with her. Well, I mean, I think it's going to be a discussion, and we will um, we will do a discussion with uh, Matt Bernard from uh, Plenty. Um, I think it's about um, to talk about perhaps something that we. I don't want to. I don't want to use the future of food, but it's it's. It would be an interesting conversation. How how what is the future of food? What is what do we need to do to better this world, to better humanity, and 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 what are the tools that are given to us to do this, and um, where where the idea come from, and. Um, what we do we feel about this? So I think it's going to be a very interesting conversation because I think we have all of us kind of like think the same, but I think we're going to find a, a probably different answer from each other uh, that could help people to think maybe differently. Um, I think it's going to be a conversation, I hope, to um, uh, kind of uh, help the curiosity of others to listen. So, Mark, you've um, you've been a long advocate. I was going through your your bio and even your social media. For in fact, Ed, you've been a long advocate for uh, creating a better food system. And I was wondering why it is so important to eat locally grown food. You know, it's funny when the local thing started, not at its very very beginning, but when people started to talk about locavorism, it was kind of a fetish and a way to get like precious ingredients. But if you think about what it means, first of all, until 150 years ago, everybody was a locavore. There was no food from anywhere locavore, else. Locavore, I like that phrase. Right, so, um, you know, you might have had some exotic spices coming from the Far East, or you, there was world trade, but I mean, people mostly ate locally. And if you think about it, you are not gonna process, you are not gonna make bad food, hyper-processed food, on a local basis. In other words, you're not going to say, let's go down to the local McDonald's factory where they're producing buns, burgers, cheese, etc. You know that stuff is coming from somewhere else and getting assembled locally. Same with half the stuff in the supermarket, three quarters of the stuff in the supermarket, which is really not food or not mm. particular good food. Much of it is not food at all. That's not local food. If you're talking about local food and I, you don't have to put a rule you know a 50 mile rule or even a 150 mile rule if you're talking about regional food food that comes you know that's trucked into your city or town you're talking about food that's grown for the most part on real farms nearby and that's the food that we ought to be eating so you know we could talk about this all day and we will deal with some of this on the panel um, that's the food that solves our problems. That's the food that makes us healthy. That's the food that respects the soil. That's the food that you can look the producer in the eye and say, where did this thing come from? How did it get grown? How did it get caught, produced, raised, killed, whatever? And you can get the answers to those questions. You can't get that with industrially produced food. You have no idea where it comes from. You have no idea what's in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dominique, uh, in the Chef's Table episode about you, there's a lot of imagery of you going and tasting food uh, in and around the Bay Area. And I was curious to know why you think we should care if our food comes, uh, why it should come from a local farm versus somewhere that's thousands of miles away. Well, I mean, I will, um, I totally agree with Mark. Um, 
what you have to understand is, first of all, we have to care. So just take away the, the food system or anything, but just look at yourself as, as, as a human. You want to know what you're putting in your body, right? You want, sure. you know, you want to have those information. If you don't want those information, then, you know, um, I'm not sure, you know, you put something that is foreign to your body, your body is going to react to it. So if you put food that is not food through your body and, and you don't know where that comes from, it's going to react to it. That's, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, but I think this is something that it's obvious, you know. Um, Can I interrupt for one second? Just sorry. Can I, do you mind? You know, go ahead. So we have Daphne Miller on the panel this afternoon who is a scientist and is a doctor and can talk about the things we don't know about, sure. about how soil, soil health affects your health and how what's grown in the soil and what comes out of that soil has a direct impact on what your life is like. And that's not going to happen if you're talking about, I mean, it, it'll happen in a negative way if you're talking about industrially produced food grown on 3,000 acres in the middle of Iowa. And it'll happen in a positive way if you're talking about real food grown you know, on 100 acres 20 miles outside of Austin. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I mean, uh, also, you know, uh, there is uh, there is something. It's it's quite powerful when you start to. Um, first of all, it's good for the soil. It's good for uh, everybody knows that. But when you start to, to eat locally and 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 engage with with you know your farmers and your surrounding and your customer, there is something that's happening. You we we are in a world right now where we totally disengage. We will live in a world of convenience, greediness, and all that, and there is there is no connection anymore. You have, we have to bring back that connection, connection to we have to work back with nature. We can't be detached with nature anymore. But this is a very important thing, and and for me to 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 learn about those young farmer a farmer that's struggling really break my heart. That's why we like so. I mean, I think I'm. I live in a beautiful community in San Francisco and in California. We have a chance, we're very lucky to have amazing farmers, but we, as, as, as an industry, we want to support them because not just because we want to, it's, it's crucial for the future of the community, the food, and for our health, you know. So I think, it's, I think it's very important. And I think also when Matt, um, Mark um, brought up, you know, the importance also for food for kids, you know. We need also to have local food for, our, for the kids at school. We have to start there too, you know. Food is the core of the society. If there is no food, there is no society. Mm. So Yeah. Mark, I know you're affiliated with a documentary that uh, showcases the negative consequences of big agribusiness, but I was curious to know um, about where we're actually making progress when it comes to our food system. Um. <laughs> You know, it's, it's really tough, and, you know, and under the current administration, it's getting tougher. But, um, you know, progress, I think we have to look at progress as a global thing, because in a way, the United States has gone as far bad as any country could go when it comes to food, and we are the shining example of what goes wrong when you allow mega corporations to run the food system. Um, when you have no regulation and when you, um, when you really allow trade and profits to rule what happens in food. And, you know, as a result, we have the so-called obesity crisis, which is really what we have is a crisis of chronic disease. We have um, soil that's increasingly impoverished and washing away. We have polluted waterways. We have huge contribution to climate change. This is an answer to a question about where things are going. Progress, well. progress, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> progress. Progress. Where's the good in all of this? So I think if we, if we look around the world, there are countries that are starting to say, well, we want to maintain our traditions. We want to encourage small farms. We want to encourage uh, children to eat well. We want to do school food right. We want to do subsidies for fruits and vegetables so that people of any income level can have access to good food mm -hmm. and so on. It's real, it, you know, it's happening in the United States in some regions. There's a, I mean, not to get too granular, but there's a thing called Good Food Purchasing Program, which is a program that helps cities figure out how to buy better food for their institutions, schools, prisons, hospitals, and so on. That's a really good thing. It's a 
It's a tiny little, you know, tiny little soda taxes, I think. Tiny little glimmer of hope, you know, but there are some things out there. Mm -hmm. It's funny how you've been described as fiery, and I just think of you as a, just an effective communicator. Um, Dominique, uh, I wouldn't mind being fiery. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've been brought up, uh, for the most part, uh, if we have been brought up in the home with someone cooking, it's been mostly uh, our mothers cooking for us. Sure. And yet men are primarily dominant in the restaurant world. Yes. Which is, in, which is ironic. Uh, you now, you've been pretty outspoken about gender equality in the kitchen. What's it going to change? Or what's it going to take, I should say, to change the status quo? Well, I think this is a this is a, a bigger. Um, uh, has nothing really to do with my industry. I think it's a. It's, it's, I'm not going to say trouble, but I think we need to start with the co the, the society, how the society is grooming um, uh, the youngster, or the young girl, or the. The young, the, the young boy, and and try to educate it herself at home and how we treat each other with respect. And from that, when you start with the children at home, then it will start also starting to change in our industry. You know, if you don't have that education in my industry, then it doesn't matter what, what what I implement. You know, in in my own work, is people needs to. Be, they need to be willing to change, but they need to be also educated. But it starts at home. I mean, the whole system. We need to. We need to to change a lot. I mean, I was reading uh, this. Um, this an article that came out a few days ago for the from the World Bank, I believe, and they uh, were putting out there uh, how many countries in the world that where women are equal to men. As I think it was six only. Six. That, that score 100 percent. And I think the United States was not even in the top 50 and score 83.6 percent. So when you look at those data, you know there's so much work to be done. And um, I truly believe it, it starts at home and it starts also with the government that we have in with laws and I remember when I when I watched that documentary with uh, Ruth Ginsburg, and she was saying that when she became um, uh, the Supreme Court, um, that I think there was over 130 laws that were mm -hmm. against women. So we just have to look at those. You know, I mean, equality is a big word. It's not it's not there yet, and mm -hmm. I think we I think every day we it's a process. So if we talk about it and if we start to change it and and really, I think education is going to be a key and 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 to believe in that I think that's that that could be a great thing. And for us, you know, the work that we do at work, you know, is it's to create uh, an environment where we give a lot of education and and we try to. Um, you know, make people understand that respect is very important and no one is better than the other one, a woman or a man. Is, everybody needs to be equal and everybody is equal, but it's a process. So, In the culinary world, you are very famous. Uh, bon Appetit had an article that read uh, the headline, Dominique Crenn Slayed 2018. Uh, you have a James Beard Award for Best Chef and now you're the first female chef in the U.S. to be awarded three Michelin stars. So. I'm assuming there's quite a few people who are coming to you and asking for advice, and I'm wondering if there's some practical advice you've been giving to, you know, young chefs, aspiring chefs, particularly female chefs. Well, um, you know, I, I, I really did dislike this female connotation of things. Please, yeah. And um, obviously, it's uh, I'm looking at it. I've a cook is a cook, um, a journalist is a journalist, right? A writer is a writer. We never. There's no gender, you know, it's like you go to a kitchen, you're going to eat the food, doesn't matter if it's a woman or a man that's cooking. So it was always, you know, it's really tricky. But I do understand this is also something that I can use that maybe perhaps as a platform to inspire others. Um, you know, what's interesting uh, with a youngster, especially a young girl and, and young woman, girls and young women, and the same thing was applied to me. We want to look up to someone. We want to relate to someone. We want to have a mentor or, or someone that perhaps look like us. 
And um, if I can be perhaps one of those, and I, I'm, I'm more than happy to inspire others, because they inspire me too, but it's, uh, um, it's, 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 it's very important. There is, there is this, uh, I think, this commercial. It's not this, this commercial. It's not a commercial, but there is these things that it's all over at the internet right now about the youngster, the young woman, talking about closing the gap between gender. Uh -huh. And I don't know if you've seen that. I've seen a lot. Is it the Nike ad you're speaking of? No, it's okay. not. A, it's uh, it's not an it's not an ad, and it's just it's very inspiring. Of this, just young girl that's speaking up about how they the things you know they've been treated and and you know nobody asks us if we want to dream about p being a president or doctor or writers you know and it's so powerful so is there is a need they want they want to look up to others and but we need you know they definitely also big teacher what's happening right now with the youngster that are fighting climate change it's amazing. It's in. I think it's in Davos. I'm. 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 I'm not quite sure, but yeah, that's amazing. I mean, it's like those youngsters. Like they are walking the street and they demand and they know. And for me, it's just one of the most inspired things that I've seen through the years. That's great. But they know. They know better than us. You know, when you have a, a young class of of a youngster that asks question to a senator. And the senator kind of look at them that you're not old enough to know. Mm. It's like that really scared me because they are old enough to know. They have better answer that sometime that we have. And we need to look at also the younger generation because they're also very inspiring. Mm -hmm. But we also have to do the work and be able to uh, be a part of the change. And that's perhaps what I have today. And, and, and yes, I do want to use that to be able to be a part of it also. Mark, uh, in your world, in your sphere, where are you seeing us making progress in terms of uh, gender equality? I mean, I think we well, are making progress. I, I think, um, and I look back over the last literally 50 years um, since I first became, since I I remember my first International Women's Day, which we just celebrated a couple of days ago, and the struggles were very much the same. And yet, um, you know, we have seen women take on more important roles in society. It's still not anywhere near where it needs to be, but I think there's an understanding mm -hmm. that it needs to be, it does need to be not irrelevant, but there shouldn't be a question about about what someone's gender is. Um, and that we are making progress in that way. And I think, you know, to be, to be quite particular, I think the most recent congressional elections were really, really a positive thing. And yet they raised the number of women in the House of Representatives to something like 15% or 20%. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's not 50%, that's right. for sure. And yet, you know, there are more women elected in this election than at any time previously. So it's moving in the right direction, which is still a long, long way to go. I, I would also add that, you know, the more women we have in power, both politically and in the business world, in the food world, in every part, the better things will be. I really believe that. So I agree to that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's a goal that's that's in men's interest also. I mean, men have been running things for a long time, and they're completely screwed up. So, you know, it can't get worse. <laughs> uh, we're almost out of time, unfortunately. But I would love to know from you because you know so much about this world. You live it. You breathe it. If there are any rising stars just one or two off the top of your head that we should be paying attention to in the culinary world? Rising star in the... Some, maybe not even necessarily a star, just someone we should be paying attention to. Well, I pay attention with, to the, to, with my team, and I'm telling you there is a couple of those young women that are pretty amazing. So, yes, I mean, i just looking how I, I lead and, and how my team is. And so, yes, there's a lot that's, that's going to come out, I'm telling you. <laughs> okay. 
I mean, I don't really even know enough about the culinary world to answer that question at this point. I think it kind of goes back to your question before, which is that, you know, the more we see, and it's not just a gender issue, the, the more we see of um, new voices, mm -hmm. of new kinds of people having positions of power, having platforms, having uh, a way to make themselves heard, the better things will be. That's a perfect way to end this. Mark Good. Bittman, sure. Dominique Crenn. Thank uh, you for It's an honor to have you on this couch at the same time. It's incredible. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. And for those of you out there watching, thank you so much uh, for tuning in. Your panel discussion, I believe, is at 5 p.m. today. 3.30. 3.30, excuse 3 me, uh, here at South by Southwest. So stay tuned to South by Southwest uh, Live.